It's good to be back. Thanks for having me back. It's a great joy for me to join you in worship and to be in the pulpit where one of my favorite preachers as well as a mentor of mine also ministers here. I'm grateful. Grateful also for the way you've welcomed Son and, and as he ministers to you, pray that we can pray for him together in both coasts as he ministers and as he labors for the Lord. This morning, we're going to be turning to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. <clears throat> Trusting that you found it in your Bible, or at least on your phone, let's read Colossians 3, 1 through 4. Hear now the word of the Lord. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So far, the reading of his word. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer. O Lord, we pray that as your sons and daughters gather, that you'll be among us, O Lord. Open our eyes, that we may behold your glory amongst us. Open our ears so that we may hear your voice directly. May our hearts be moved by your spirit, O Lord, that not only will we understand the text better in terms of the word before us, but that you will teach us to apply these things to our lives. For we pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Stephen L. Carter is the William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Law at Yale Law School and a Christian, Anglican in fact. Among his writings is The Culture of Disbelief, published in 1994, where a chapter title caught my eye, and the chapter was titled, God as a Hobby, God as a Hobby. Although his discussion focused on politics and its use of religion, something very important for our season where we determine our next president, the phrase can also be applied to our lives of faith. Often, God is a hobby to us, and you know what hobbies are like. They're temporary, provisional, and oftentimes a corner of our lives where it doesn't have any pervasive influence upon who we are and what we do. This title appropriately describes the situation of the Christian church in the Colossae area, in many ways portrays the way perhaps you and I practice our faith as well. We see a glimpse of this in Colossians 3.2 where Paul exhorts the believers to not focus on earthly things, perhaps because he does see that many of us, and particularly the Christians in Colossae, are focusing on earthly things. And what is Paul opposing here? Specifying the religion or religions that Paul was opposing is quite difficult. Perhaps the best way we can describe what the religious landscape looked like during that time was to refer to it as simply syncretism. Syncretism is what happened in the Roman uh, environment as well as the way that perhaps you and I practice our faith now as, a, as well. Syncretism was a common characteristic of the first century believers and the Roman culture where the idea was that instead of dividing and separating, you are inclusive of all things. Where instead of saying simply, my God versus your God, you cover all the bases saying that it's both gods is the way you operated your religious convictions and beliefs. It was interesting. Um, we last summer had the opportunity to go to Thailand because I was speaking at a conference out there, and we decided we were going to eat ramen for the rest of our year by taking the whole family, my two kids, Anna and Simeon, 9 and 11, at that time 10 and 8. And we had a chance to go to the conference, which, where we had a wonderful time, and then visited Bangkok. And if you've been to Van Bangkok, it's a city full of temples. And as these Buddhist temples are there, my kids were taken by their parents to visit one of them called the Reclining Buddha, which is, I think, about 100 yards long. I mean, literally, Reclining Buddha for the whole building that's in there. Well, my son and my daughter were both nervous about the whole event because there's something about that environment that didn't sit well with them. In fact, after about half an hour, they wanted to go back to the hotel, so we left. But I remember one incident where as my son was walking into one of the rooms where one of the hundreds of Buddhas were there, he tripped. And as he tripped, he was catching himself and he found himself 
going like this in front of Buddha. It was a horrifying experience for him. He turned to us, his face was white, ashen. And because what we had talked to them before was, this is their culture, we respect it, but we don't believe it. But as he came out, he turned to his mom and he was tearful saying, mommy, did I just worship Buddha and is God going to hate me as a result of it? Now, my wife is genuinely a good parent. I, on the other hand, I'm just a tag along. I would have gone a different way I, where I thought it might have been funny. But she sat him down and carefully instructed him about the difference between a physical dipping of the head with no intentions and desires and perhaps what true worship looks like. But in many ways, that's the kind of struggle that first century folks were having. Surrounded by all kinds of idols, many chose not to distinguish but accept all. And following all the religions and the religious precepts, oftentimes we can simply refer to as syncretism. In this environment, I think the best way to describe it is that Christians were struggling to maintain their faith in Christ. And oftentimes their faiths were tainted with the notion it's Christ plus a blank. Fill in the blank. It may be different idols, different religions. Perhaps for you and I in the 21st century, that blank may be something different altogether. Maybe not religion in the strictest of sense, but those things that we find significance in our lives, whether it be our family, our children, our work, our careers, our experiences, all these things that dictate the way we prioritize our convictions and our lives. It's to these people that Paul's writing. And as Paul writes, he's, a he's answering their syncretistic tendencies by reminding them of three things where, as I pose them in questions, they're answered this way. He asks, who are you? Where are you? How then shall you live? Who are you? Where are you? And how then shall you live? We want to take those questions one at a time as he responds to us in the text by reminding us of several facts here. The first question is, who are you? Or perhaps more personally, who am I? He reminds us that we are people united with Christ. If you read Colossians from the beginning, you might have noticed a pattern. Just in chapter 2 alone, he says, built up in him, filled in him. In him you are also circumcised, buried with him in baptism, raised with him, and made alive together with him. Now, just in those brief references, you see the repetition of in him and with him. These words are repeated 163 times in the 13 letters of Paul, a shorthand for the concept and the overarching concept of our union with Christ. Of course, this concept sets up our text this morning as it begins in chapter 3, verse 1 by saying, since then you have been raised with Christ. Verse 3, for you died, and the assumption here going back to chapter 2 is with Christ. Verse 3, your life is hidden with Christ. It grounds what he wants to command us to do. For our identity cannot be up understood apart from our union with Christ. This is why in chapter 2 he says, Having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through our faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. He concludes in verse 20 of chapter 2 by saying, Since you died with Christ... To the basic principles of this world, why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? This union describes a spiritual reality that is often described as mystical. And it's certainly difficult for us to explain fully. What is assumed by Paul, however, is that we participate in the death and resurrection of Christ. Jesus, as our representative, lived a perfect life and gave himself for our sins so that by the virtue of our union with Christ, Christ received just punishment for our sins upon the cross. But thankfully, that's not where the story actually ends. Christ then was raised from the dead, declared innocent and righteous, and we along with him also were declared righteous. And in Christ, we were raised to a new life, a new reality, a new state, where we full, whether we fully understand that or not. 
The scripture reminds us that as, as a result of our union with Christ, we belong to Christ. We fully belong to him. This is why our forefathers of faith next year is the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, and there will be a lot of conferences discussing different elements of the Reformation period. One angle that some will take is about the catechisms and confessions of the first century, and one of my favorites, despite the PCA ordination that I received, is actually a Q&A that comes from the Heidelberg Catechism, which is the Dutch Reformed tradition, where the question is asked this way, what is your only comfort in life and in death? What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I belong, that I belong, body and soul, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. That I belong, body and soul, and in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. We belong to him. You, friends, belong to him. Your value and your significance is based on the very fact that you belong to him. To put it another way, God doesn't love you because you're valuable no matter what you think you are, but you are valuable because you're loved. The identity comes from being loved. The world says that you're valuable because of your successes, but God says that you're valuable simply because you belong to him. It's our belongingness to him that the Lord reminds us of. During the summer, I had this wonderful opportunity every four years that you also get to see a, a spectacle called the Olympics. We love it. It's about the only time in about four years we watch sports that we never watch any other time. It's about the only two weeks we watch things like synchronized swimming, right? Or things like something like rhythmic gymnastics. No idea who thought of that. Or perhaps steeplechase. I mean, in fact, it, these are things that I wish I could participate in, categories that I cannot really understand why they exist in the first place. But for some reason... Just those two weeks, you're engrossed by these things. Uh, as a Korean American, I watched the archery teams as Koreans dominated. As an American, I watched the basketball teams as they dominated the court. But one particular sport stood out for me just because of the participants, and it was 10-meter platform synchronized diving. Now, whoever thought of that, I'm not sure. 10-meter diving itself seems crazy enough but they decided to one-up the ante by saying that two people are going to do it together. Four years ago, an American named Badaya, David Badaya, actually won the solo 10-meter platform. This time, he entered as one of the favorites for the duo synchronized diving, 10 meters. After he won the silver uh, this year, the NBC uh, um, uh, reporter actually brought both men together, and she started interviewing them. And then one of the questions that she asked I found very interesting was, how did you handle the pressure? Because you were expected to win in some ways. How did you handle the pressure? David Badaya replied, it's just an identity crisis, he said. When my mind is on this diving and I'm thinking I'm defined by my diving, then my mind goes crazy. But we both know that our identity is in Christ and we're thankful for this opportunity to be able to dive in front of Brazil and in front of the United States. It's been an absolutely thrilling moment for us, which I think caught the reporter off guard. Um, this is... NBC, after all, and it's an international scene where this person said, my identity is not in my silver medal that I'm biting on as I receive it, but it's in Jesus Christ. To take the sting away in some ways, she turns to his partner and asks him the same question. And his teammate chimed in. The way David just described it was flawless. The fact that I was going into this event knowing that my identity is rooted in Christ and not what the result of this competition is just, just gave me peace. It let me enjoy the contest. It was a terrific scene, whereas it is, anything but Christianity dominates the land. But here is this one occasion where is this shining light shone on their faith by these two individuals who took some social risks for this as they share their faith so well. But it's oftentimes when athletes share their faith as they point up to the sky or do the t it's flamboyant without much meaning 
Because oftentimes both the losing team and the winning team simply talk about how God's on their side. That's fine and dandy. There's nothing wrong with it. But this is one of those moments where the person sharing of faith is not just about winning or losing or who's on whose side, but where their theology was actually accurate because their identity is not in their diving nor in their winning. Their identity is rooted in Christ. And here the Lord reminds you and I, Who are you? Who am I? We are people by the blood of Jesus Christ who are united to him. We belong to him. This is where the second question becomes very important because the question is, where are you? Where am I? Colossians 3, verses 3 through 4 say, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. In Philippians 1.23, another book written at a time when Paul was sitting in prison, the imprisoned Paul struggles with what he wants. You remember the scene when he says, to live is Christ and to die is gain, and some commentators talk about the fact that he is suicidal here, uh, not really understanding perhaps what he's struggling with. Should he desire life so that he may continue in ministry for Christ, or should he desire death so that he may, quote, be with Christ? That phrase is important because to be with Christ, or other phrases like it, have future place in mind. That is, here Paul is referring to that time in period where we will be with Christ, always a future. What's amazing about this statement in verses 3 through 4 in Colossians, however, that this reality, often assumed to be in the future, is actually a present reality. The future, that is, heaven, is already here. Your life is hidden with Christ, Paul tells us. That's how the ESV translates it, a translation that I'm sure many of you are accessing this morning. The translation that I grew up with, the NIV, New International Version, or as we like to call it, Nearly Inspired Version, (laughs) translate this Uh, phrase slightly differently. In fact, it adds one word that actually makes explicit what we're referring to here when he says, your life is now hidden with Christ. It's now hidden with Christ. Perhaps this is why Colossians is so preoccupied with heaven. Just in chapter 1 alone, verse 5, the hope that is stored up for you in heaven. Verse 16, things in heaven and on earth. Verse 20, things on earth or things in heaven. Verse 23, to every creature under heaven, he said. With cumbersome terms, theologians have tried to explain the reality. Things like semi-eschatological, inaugurated eschatology, or the already and the not yet. All these phrases are trying to describe a reality. A reality that Paul tries to explain here is the reminder that because we belong to Jesus Christ, we are where he is already. We are hidden with Christ, he said. We are no longer citizens here, and our home is not this place. This is why the New Testament authors often refer to Christians as sojourners aliens, and pilgrims, because this is not our home. That's not just a logo or a tagline. This is exactly what Scripture teaches about us. If we belong to Christ, we are where Christ is, and this is not our home. We are simply pilgrims and sojourners. One of, one of my former students, who is now an Anglican priest, as he travels often for short, short-term missions trips, one time in Peru wrote these words in his online diary. I, I find it amazing, along with Pastor Steve, that you guys do Bible study online. I didn't think I was all that old, but I feel like Pastor Steve now, uh, just because I feel so out of touch in terms of perhaps what's taking place here. But this is what David Olenskis says. There is almost nothing that reminds me more of the fact that I am a stranger and exile upon this earth, awaiting a homecoming still to come in the city whose designer and maker is God, than traveling to other countries. Not just as a tourist, but as a sojourner. 
A sojourner is neither passerby nor native. Rather, the sojourner comes to live, but not to belong. The sojourner can adopt the language, clothing, customs, food, friends, property, and family of the country into which he has entered. Yet, at the end of the day, the sojourner owns a passport which states that he is a citizen of another realm with the rights and responsibilities of that citizenship and that he remains in a foreign land for but a while longer, no matter how much he may love and cherish it, he said. Physically, we're here. We're, we're simply immigrants and aliens here. Where we belong, and in fact, where our mind and heart should be, is our eternal home, because that's where Christ is. This is why scripture reminds us that we belong there. We are citizens there. And in fact, we are hidden with Christ here. So if the first question was, who are you, that we belong to Jesus Christ, where are you, is that while physically we are here, spiritually we are where Christ is. Heaven is our home. This leads to his exhortation for us this morning. Because the final part of his equation is, how then shall you live? How then shall I live? This is how he summarizes this for us when he says, when he characterizes the sojourner's life and pilgrims by repeating this phrase in Colossians 3, 4, when he says, when Christ, who is your life? When Christ, who is your life? More woodenly translated, this translates Christ, your life. For those of you who are English language or grammar uh, oriented, this is an appositional phrase, isn't it, right? My wife, is, her name is Sharon. When I say something like, my wife, comma, Sharon, closing comma, it's two different words that refer to the same referent. That's called apposition. And that's my wife. Well, here he says, Christ, your life. For those of you who are mathematically inclined, it's an equation, isn't it? Christ equals your life. That there is no distinction between the two. There is an equation that's involved here. They are one and the same. Christ equals your life. Thus Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Friends, notice what he does not say. <clears throat> he does not say that your family is your life. He does not say that your spouse is your life. Sorry for the spouses that are sitting next to one another. I'm not just saying this because my wife is not here. I would say this even if she were. He does not say that your children are your lives. He does not say that your job nor your career is your life. He does not say, and this is important for us, you and I in this generation to remember, he does not say that your pleasure and your rest and vacation is your life. No, all these things are important in and of themselves, but they pale in comparison to the one who gives meaning and significance and security, who is Jesus Christ. And this is why I like the simplicity of what Paul says. Christ is your life. In Christ, all things hold together because all things were created through him and for him, he said earlier in Colossians, Christ is the priority, the purpose, and the focus of our lives. But you may be saying here, Joel, I, I've heard that from Pastor Steve many a times. Pastor Sun says this over and over again. What does this life look like, however? Well, he, Paul tries to explain this by saying in verse 1 and 2, seek the things that are above. Verse 2 Set your minds on things that are above. This is a difficult phrase. One thing I can say is that it's a life where heaven is prioritized. Heaven is prioritized. It's kind of like I lived in Michigan for some time. I know the weather is beautiful outside. I get to enjoy fall season. For somebody who's from San Diego, this is not a very commonplace thing for me. It's beautiful. 
but winter is shortly coming, which is also the reason why I live in California. But I used to live in Michigan where we used to get a lot of snow. And I used to serve at a church that was about 130 miles one way away. And every time when it snowed, I would drive behind a semi-truck because the truck would cut the road. And then I will follow it, which means I double my time in terms of how long it takes for me to get to the places. And every time, I'll put on James Taylor, who single-handedly saved acoustic guitar from electric guitar during the 70s. And I would sing his song called, In My Mind, I'm Going to Carolina. Thankfully, Carolina has the number of syllables that's equal to California. And I will sing this song over and over again, saying, in my mind, I'm going to California. Can't you see the sunshine? Can't you just feel the moonshine? Maybe just like a friend of mine, it hit me from behind. Yes, I'm going to California in my mind. I don't know if you've ever sang that song before. Maybe I can explain another way. I see a lot of moms here, mothers with children. I remember when my wife first got pregnant with our daughter, Anna. The daughter was coming eight months later from the time we found out. But yet, the whole life changes. Um, she no longer drank coffee, although she loved drinking coffee. We no longer ate sushi because mercury is bad for the baby, right? We started listening to classical music, which we never listened to ever before in our marriage, and she forced me to talk to her stomach because the, uh, the baby needs to understand the daddy's voice uh, before the baby came. We took my office, which was a perfectly good room, and converted into a baby's room where furniture sat for seven and six months without use all in preparation for the gift that was to come. With second and third children, that, that doesn't really matter. That kind of explains how our second child is now, I think. Um, the coffee, sushi, it, does, it doesn't really matter at that point in time. And for those of you with children more than one, I think you know what I mean. But I bring that up as an expression of saying, we know what it means to prioritize something that comes later in the present. We reorganize our lives because the life to come is much more significant and important than the life that we desire to live for the present. What does this life look like? I don't have a clue, to be honest. More importantly, this may look quite different from one person to the next. But I will say this as a summary concept. It's a life focused on matters of eternal consequences, which forces us to have a loose grip on the present and the now. It reminds this generation of instant gratification that delayed gratification might be much more satisfying. It's a that life that recognizes the difference between a good life and a godly life, and moreover, a life that is convinced that the godly life is the good life no matter what others might say about it. It's a life that recognizes and heeds these words of Francis Chan when he says, our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. Can I say that again? Our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. Has absolutely no eternal significance. It's a life that prioritizes heaven. But furthermore, it's a life that daily experiences homesickness. Because this is not our home, you see. A misfit, an alien, and a stranger who is seeking a heavenly home. Have you noticed, friends, that as Christians, we are becoming more and more in America a misfit, an alien, and a stranger? Times are changing. The environment around us in America, we have the benefit and joy of the Lord's blessings upon this country in terms of freedom of religion for the last three centuries. But we are facing changing times where the environment feels and noticeably looks more like the first century Rome than 20th century America. But it, no, it doesn't matter to us because we recognize that this is not our home. The one who sees the fallen world and knows that things are not the way it's supposed to be and commits himself and herself and prays for the Lord's grace and hopes in the future. It's someone who is homesick, desiring a home not built by human hands, but built by God's hands. 
I'm not a big fan of the outdoors. I don't know if that's a confession that any man should make. Um, we have a role reversal in our family. A few days ago before I left, Sharon was working hard to fix the printer that we have that was out of whack. And I was busy sewing my button on on a shirt uh, that I had where the button fell off. And you may think that that's kind of odd, but that's very normal and routine in our family. Sharon knows how to fix things. I just don't. Another element is Sharon likes the outdoors. I think of outdoors as something we look out the window uh, as much as we can, things that we need to go through from the house to the car. Camping is not one of my favorite things. Um, but Sharon's convinced that this is good for our children, and I think indirectly she's never said it good for me as well. So every year we go camping. I have a perfectly good home. It's a small one, but it works really well. Uh, good kitchen, uh, air conditioning and heater, and a bed that we spent a lot of money on when we got married that I really enjoy sleeping in. And then we choose to live in a tent where we are cold at night, way too hot during the day. A uh, manly thing to do is to start a fire to cook uh, and not an oven that we simply turn on. And our kids walk around and run around completely dark and dirty. And somehow that's acceptable and good. And we say to ourselves over and over again that food eaten outside tastes so much better, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. It tastes exactly the same. And in fact, I like to use my fork and knives inside, is what I'm thinking. But there's something about camping that's really good for me. Every single day that passes by, it makes me long for home. <laughs> one step closer to going home. I think about the comforts. I think about the blessings. I think about the heat and air conditioning that provides cover and protection. Oftentimes, you and I are way too comfortable here. The kind of tension that is required of believers living in the already and the not yet, who recognize that this is not our home, oftentimes is forgotten among us because we are way too comfortable here and we hold tightly to whatever we have here, believing and convincing ourselves and thinking, without this, my life would not be meaningful. This is where Paul reminds us, to the Colossians who are struggling with the very thing, saying, Jesus is great, but I need everything else to make my life complete. And perhaps you and I sitting here saying the same. We're unwilling to admit it on a Sunday morning where we're dressed nicely, sitting at church, where we are able to sing the songs of words that say, Jesus is my all in all, but deep inside, well, Jesus is great, but I have these things to solve, these provisions to make, these children to get through college, and my future needs to be something that I need to control. No, friends, that's not how this works. And what Paul reminds us is simply this. Friends, for those of you who confess Jesus Christ as Lord, you belong to him. Your life is not your own anymore. You belong to Jesus Christ. Your home is not the address that you walk into tonight after worship and after church. Your home is heaven where Christ is seated. If that is the case, here Paul reminds us, you should live with heaven as your priority. Your life should be organized with the attention to the fact that things of eternal consequences matter more to us than things of temporary significance, and that we should be daily homesick, daily homesick. Enjoy the blessings that the Lord has given, but remember daily, this is not your home. You long for his return. You're not saying simply, come next year when I've done these things. But you echo the words of the book of Revelation in saying, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Come today. We long to see you. We long to experience you. We desire to be with you forever and evermore. May that be your longing. May the conviction of your identity in Christ Jesus as you belong to him. May your understanding of your place in heaven above with him. And may your daily decisions, which prioritize your home and heaven and sick to be there, be a part of who you are as you seek to live for him. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Thank you, O Lord, for loving us, despite the fact that we're sinful people who are unlovable. 
Thank you for saving us in Christ Jesus, our Lord, who gives us life and hope. Thank you for uh, allowing us to see that we belong to you, that our significance comes not from our own doing and our experiences because they're mere meager things in the eyes of the world and in comparison to your perfection, they're nothing. But that we belong to you and our, our value comes from being loved by you. Thank you for reminding us that our home is in heaven and not here, which allows us to prioritize heaven and be homesick. There are so many of us here who boast and perhaps take pride and significance in the things of this world. Lord, humble us so that we may recognize these things as belonging to you. Your glory in them is our desire. For those, O oh Lord, who are daily seeking your face because of need and lack, pray that you remind us that Jesus is enough that our desire to uh, possess you, despite the lack of possessions elsewhere, be satisfactory to us, O oh Lord, and do grant to us contentment in our hearts. Thank you for Jubilee and the way it has ministered so faithfully for so many years in the Philadelphia region. We pray, pray for your blessings upon the pastors and the leaders and every congregant that's here, O oh Lord, that they may be able to rise up to shine your glory to all those that we meet and see in this area. For we pray these things in your name with great gratitude and thanks in our hearts. Amen.